Okay, so let me just start off with one thing, admitting that I was wrong, but only beforehand, because what I thought is what many reviewers actually said in their review, that the Samsung Galaxy S9 is just an iterative update. But once I got it here, as always, I reset all my opinions to what I thought this phone might be. And even though all those changes might be quite small, they actually have a big impact on the overall experience in my opinion. And that's something we are going to talk about and I would say take some time because it could take a while talking about the S7. As you can see here I have the Lilac version and here's also already the first thing. Design wise not much has changed. Yes the chin has become a little bit smaller which is something that most people would never really notice. I definitely don't think I would have. But what I've noticed is and I'm not quite sure why that is the case but the back now compared to last year feels way more solid because I complained about last year that it sounded very hollow like a toy but something feels more premium this time because it felt a little bit cheap. This now feels way more luxurious. It has this heft that I wanted to have. Not quite the same as on the S7 but I think it feels better than the S8. Even though things like of course the curves are pretty much always the same and the build quality is just about the same. We still have a very good tactile feedback. Actually it clicks a little bit more now. Placement is good. Still not the biggest fan of the buttons because the Bixby button, yes, you will mistake it quite often with the volume rocker and I personally prefer the volume rocker on the other side but I'm not gonna complain also about things like the Bixby button itself because if you don't want to use it at all, if you don't like Bixby, you can just download apps for example like Bixby or Bix Actions and just disable it if you really don't want to use it. But I would say at least give it a chance and to cover this already, I did not really use it much. I get it, it's fine, but if you don't wanna don't complain. It's better to have a feature that you don't use instead of not having it and it could maybe be possibly helpful. Now the camera as you can see actually sticks out just a little bit same as the fingerprint reader and I have to say the fingerprint reader location now is way better than it was for example in the past on the S8 obviously but on some other phones and it's good and it's actually quite nice that it is raised because usually if you just pick it up from a pocket outside you feel this little of an edge and then you just know you have to slide it around and it unlocks. Even though I have to say the fingerprint reader itself is not really one of the best ones because as you can see the whole unlock process until it actually recognizes and the screen turns on is quite long. It's very reliable and once the screen is on you can also see that it works quite okay. But in case you don't want to use it at all, which I definitely don't recommend you to because it works so good, is the iris scanner and the face unlock because you have this kind of intelligent unlocking. So whenever you hit, it either uses the iris or the face detect and usually it works quite good. So let's just try this once again, show him the face and it works okay. It's not the crazy fast one. It's not as fast as on a OnePlus 5T or on Honor View 10 or something like an iPhone. But it overall gets the job done. Of course, we have the rest of the sensors here with the LEDs, the camera as well. I personally didn't really touch the lens so much, so I'm fine with that. Overall, the only thing that I have to mention though when it comes also to design is that we have the curve, we have the edge display, which I'm usually not a fan of because we have still a lot of reflections. And this is one of the most reflective devices that I've seen because it just doesn't reflect so much on the sides where we also have some kind of color distortions, which is not a real big thing anymore because I got used to it quite quickly. But also the screen seems like the oleophobic coating or the reflective coating here is a little bit weaker. So we have a lot of reflections. This kind of makes the screen actually seem a little bit more impressive, but also more reflective. Otherwise we have the mic here and the dual SIM and SD card reader because this is the dual SIM version. Then we get of course the buttons that I said already, USB Type-C, the speaker that now also works with the earpiece and then the headphone jack. I don't think I have to talk about much more besides the fact that we have the camera of course, the um, notification LED, a small chin, definitely very small side bezels even though I have to say due to having a curve this phone feels narrower than a normal 5.8 inch would feel with 18.5 by 9. So it's still a little bit too tall in my opinion because if I use it like this it still feels a little bit top heavy which is even more of an issue on the S9 Plus than on the S9 because the S9 overall isn't all that big but it still feels awkwardly tall especially in use. But yeah that's personal preference. It looks cool yes and yeah build quality is definitely very good. Now let's talk about the display and let me actually change the language. I completely forgot that. Give me a sec. 
because I'm not gonna redo this video just because of that. Absolutely not. Okay. And here we are. Sorry for the delay. Now, we have a blue light filter, we have auto brightness, of course the brightness slider, font and zooms can still be changed. Now about the screen modes, we have adaptive, which is still the one that I like the most, AMOLED Cinema, I just think that's a little bit too yellow, same as photo, and basic, you can adjust things on your own, with the adaptive for example the warmth, and if you want to tweak the white even more so, you have that. But I personally did not change anything, I liked it the way out of the box it comes with, of course, we have add screen and a few other things. You can change your navigation bar and such, but that's more of a software thing. So let's just get into the actual display's qualities. The only thing that surprised me is when I measured it in manual mode, in manual brightness mode, I measured only 580 lux, which is actually not that bright. I know in automatic it gets brighter, but I think last year's actually went brighter even in manual mode, but it's fine. Outdoor works, it's not crazy bright, but it gets the job done. Viewing angles due to being an AMOLED, are actually quite stable and I don't really see a big shift, not nearly as on some of the, for example, LG V30 displays, so this one is solid as well. Nice white point actually, also black, definitely amazing. And of course, as you can see here, we have curves on the screen. But overall, I have to say, I almost wanted to give this display five gold stars, but I just decided not to do it because it's not a huge step up from last year's display because that one already was amazing. Once though you set it to to white QHD because out of the box it comes with 1080p plus, so just to keep that in mind. But to give it a five gold stars rating, I would have wanted something like 120 hertz if that was possible. But five stars definitely is amazing. Now let's check the sound. Definitely don't forget that this is also now a stereo speaker or a dual speaker system, so check that. Okay, so here's my opinion and don't forget one thing. I gave it five stars, which is actually what I wanted because I wanted to give it maybe a four and a half stars. But the reason why I'm giving it five instead of four and a half is just because the sound quality is really good. Because for one especially important thing, the earpiece is noticeably louder and better in terms of quality. It actually produces a higher frequency range than most dual speakers do. Because what it also does is kind of give you the mids and the bass from the bottom and then the highs from the earpiece but it also goes a little bit higher into or more low actually towards the mid-range and this allows for such a warm rich and really well done stereo sound that just because of the quality even though it could be a little bit loud i will give it five stars and i'm fully pleased this by far is now the best samsung speaker system and if it would have been even a little bit louder or a proper front-facing stereo system, which I would give full five gold stars, this is fully convincing because the quality, it's the quality that really shines. And I'm not just talking about music, but in terms of YouTube videos and such. Now the headphone jack, I want to get into that, why I give that actually also four and a half stars, which is better than I usually do. And it's not just because of the quality, it's mostly loud enough, but we get so many, actually, for many people, useful options. Dolby Atmos, I've heard people talking about it, praising it. I don't think it's any good. I would just leave it off and rather use their equalizer options or their extra options. For example, if you have a headphone jack, you also can use then the UHQ Upscaler Tube M Pro or Adapt Sound, which is something very useful because that one actually analyzes your ears and bumps up certain frequency for you to get the best sound and this will improve the sound. Dolby Atmos, in my experience, on a headphone doesn't really do much better. It actually lowers the maximum volume and just is equalized in some way, which we have by here, just way more flexible. And on the speaker, I didn't really actually notice any difference, but the headphone jack is for most normal, I would say lower impedance headphones, loud enough, it sounds quite clean and it can be adjusted. So I'm fully pleased with that. Now let's kill all apps and see how quickly they launch. And as you can see, one thing that I think actually makes this phone feel a little bit slower than it actually is, is just the animations, because it actually is now, I would say, a significant jump up from the S8, because I wasn't really super impressed with the S8 performance for reasons that it just 
still had inconsistency. It just wasn't always fluff. When it was, it was great, but it just wasn't that all the time. Now, I have to say, after using this for about a week, the only time that I've noticed after like three or four days, Flamingo got a few more stutters and legs. But once I re rebooted the system, it was fine. As you can see, it's now very fluid, very consistent. And I had no instance where any app kind of showed pretty much any lag. Everything feels buttery smooth, very nicely done. Also, the multitasking is quite fast. But as you can see, if it doesn't feel crazy snappy, it's actually more because of the animations. And yes, I obviously did set them to 0.5. Of course, setting them lower will make things even faster, but then you just don't have animations, which is something that I don't like. But fully pleased. And if I would have to complain about one thing, then it's the fact that it's not really a huge step up from last year's Snapdragon 835 phones. Because yes, it is better than this S8, noticeably better actually. But then again, if I compare it with something like a OnePlus 5T or an LG V30 or a Google Pixel, this is pretty much just about on par, so they kind of caught up. It's not really better. It, it kind of is in some ways smoother, but not really quite as, quite as lightweight. Not bashing on it because five stars, but I think the 845 in a proper optimized phone will feel a little bit lighter. But this, this is way more than enough. Of course, I have to mention that it could degrade over time, which was obviously uh, visible like after, like I said, three or four days with just one app. But who knows what happens in three or five months or something like that. Because I have to say, I personally never saw Samsung's UI as the issue for lag. But I think it's actually a user's fault. But everyone's different. Now, gaming performance was also great. Besides, for example, Riptide, which was kind of not high frame rate. But then Modern Combat and Asphalt Extreme ran perfectly fine. About the charge time of the battery now. One hour and 40 Actually, to be precise, 1 hour and 38, which is actually like 20 minutes longer than I needed for the S8. I'm not quite sure. Maybe a few more cycles would have helped that if I would have then done the test. But I think it's fast enough. And I think like after half an hour, I was at about 40%. After an hour, at about 78%. That's still more than fine enough. But when we get to the battery life, this is definitely this phone's biggest weakness. 11% already for just one hour of YouTube already showed me that it's just about an average but the actual use on mobile data like I usually always had an issue with that is not good because I would say expect at least from my not that heavy usage four to four and a half hours on mobile data four and a half to be kind of as a maximum if you maybe really use it lightly maybe five I would say closer to four but I could kill this in like three and a half hours because one day I barely made it to three and a half and that was with a little bit heavier use. So this is not a powerhouse. If you want a really reliable phone for all day without having to charge, without having um, battery life angst, just being afraid of it dying, then this is just not it. And this is the only weakness because I think also because of the heat, because this phone, if you play games, gets warm, really, really hot. And I think it actually will throttle. Not that I really tested it, but even in normal use, especially on mobile data, it got warm. Under gaming, it got really warm. I mean, like hot. And that just shows me that it's just not an efficient SOC. Standby drain was okay, but not really all that great. So biggest weakness, obviously the battery life. Now, Software, in my opinion, is not because we have the launcher here. Scrolls to the side. We have a very, very well done theming engine. It's very customizable, very flexible. A lot of great themes. Of course, the quick settings are customizable. Even though I have to say, out of the box, this already looks better than ever before. As you can see, all those apps. Now, feature-wise, I would have to go into a lot of things and it would take a lot of time. So I'm just going to focus on the most important ones. Of course, we have dual window. We have also the pop-up window where we have a smaller window that we can adjust on the advanced features. For example, we have still the gaming tools that allow you to change resolution for every game if you want to. Smart stays there, one-handed mode. Finger sensor gestures, which personally I'm not a fan of because if you swipe down, you get the notification trade. If you like that, of course, quick launch camera, multi-window, as you can see, much, much more. What else? Under sound, I already showed it. Under display, I already showed a few more things. Edge screen you have available. You have this edge panel where you can launch apps and such. Personally, something I'm not really a fan of. Navigation bar can be changed in terms of colors. 
You can also change the layout, but not really much more than just switching out the two auto buttons. That's pretty much it. And then a whole lot more that I don't want to get into. Now, obviously, updates are a thing. Many people complain about the fact that Samsung is kind of slow sometimes, but if you have a new eye that is so mighty, so powerful, it just needs time. And I don't think they put all the reserves in, but update wise, it's still okay. Not quite fast, but usually solid enough. No, let's talk about the cam and this might also take a little bit of a while because this app is very powerful. What I like is that we can quickly just by hitting the button toggle between, for example, the modes for the lighting. Also, we can swipe through all modes, which is nice. If you want to switch the cams, switch to the sides. If you want to switch the modes, just go up what's and downwards. I really like that. We have then, for example, selective mode, uh, focus, auto, slow-mo. I'm not going to go into that. Personally, yeah, it's a nice thing if you want to play it. Yeah, about that feature, the AR emoji, I don't think this is any good. I'm not even going to show mine because it doesn't look anything like me anyways. And then we have a lot of extra options. We have a quite nice pro mode that also allows us to change the big thing, the aperture between 1.5 and, as you can see here, 2.4. If you want to play with those settings, all well done. But for me, what I want to focus more into is just what the auto mode allows us and what kind of pictures we get. And here you can see already the, the selfies. And I have to say, wow. Due to having an autofocus on the front, we get a sharp picture at every moment, if you give it a little bit of time. Because a focus sometimes just needs a little bit. But then all pictures turn out very sharp. And finally, at actually some decent weather, nice colors. The white banner seems fine. We have, as you can maybe see here, the kind of selective focus as well. So a bokeh mode, it works okay, but you see definitely that it's not the best one because especially if you see it in direct comparison, as you can see here now, the kind of details and the contrast of my face changes. And this is something that I'm not so big of a fan, big of a fan because you can see it gets pale. White balance doesn't quite work that right anymore. So I wouldn't really use it on the front cam. As you can see, yeah, there are a few cams that can do it better. But it's good enough. What I was actually surprised though, as you can see here, this picture is taken in quite low light. You will see this later in the video, but the cam really achieved a great picture. So I'm pleased with that. Outside, nice. One thing that I always liked, loved actually about Samsung cameras, the amazing focus. It always gets it right quite fast. Shutter is incredibly fast. Yes, as you can most probably see, colors are a little bit over the top because they are a little bit unreal, but it's so pleasing. It's so great. If you want to get it done, maybe do it afterwards. And I actually just left HDR auto on all the time. So it just, I just leave it and let it do what it wants to do. And I think the, the pictures turn out every time great. Great sharpness, colors, focus is always right. I pretty much had no picture that wasn't a hit. I had no, pretty much no hit um, misses at all. Of course, as you can see, the selective focus on some things on the back camera doesn't work that well. That's definitely something that, for example, Google or cams with a second cam can do better. But those pics, so, so nice. Also, low light, like I said, really good because this is taken without the flash here with the flash. But there is almost no camera that can pick up so much light in dark situations, especially now with having 1.5. So, yeah, really nice. Also, indoors, no grain, very great sharpness, still top shutter times and focus. Superb. Now, about, about a video, here I have to say things are a little bit different because if we go into 4K, no, that's actually, sorry, that's the wrong video. This is, no, this, okay, yeah, let's talk about the front-facing cam. <laughs> I actually wanted to have it this way. As you can see, also, focus on the video. Nice, the picture just looks so nice and sharp. Great colors, great contrast, and it feels quite smooth. It's not really, I think, stabilized, maybe, maybe this. I'm actually not 100% sure, but the front-facing cam is absolutely great, and it's actually even available in 1440p. So noticeably sharper than 1080p. Also the sound, the mic quality was really good, clean, good quality. I don't think it's stereo as far as I'm, I remember, but no problem. Of course, if it gets darker, it gets a little bit more grainy, but that was to be ex um, expected, but really nice, especially due to having the autofocus. I'm so happy. Now let's check outside. 
Okay, the big thing, as you can see here, 4K60, not with HDR, that's where the Exynos is limited, but what you will already see is that this video doesn't always work without any hiccups. That's one complaint. I had this in almost any mode. It also is actually more visible on video. For example, the player on Samsung's phone can do it better, but especially since this is using the kind of H265, so HEVC, I think that's harder to play. I also tried the same without, so with, with the old codec, but I still had the same kind of hiccups. I think that's something that they will update quite quickly and fix, because as you can see, this is the only thing that I have an issue with. 4K60 doesn't really have stabilization like all the other modes do, but I would still actually prefer the 60 frame mode because 4K kind of seems blurry on faster movement. So that's where I preferred 4K60. But as you can see here, the hiccups. Don't bother too much about these because I think that's maybe of my unit or something was wrong because autofocus still works great, super sharp, great quality, and doesn't really change my opinion on it. I think it's more just of an early fix. Maybe just some update broke something or so. Of course, 1080p60 also looks great. Autofocus quite smooth. I think it was actually a little bit smoother on the last version because it's a very quick focus. It's not quite as quite as subtle as it was in, in, back in the days. But 1080p60 especially runs noticeably more hiccup free. But that was already it. So let's get into the rating. Talk a little bit about a few things when it comes to the negative side first. Yes, the temps get quite hot, especially if you're in a hot environment. This could become a little bit of an issue. The biggest weakness, obviously, the battery life. And yeah, it feels a little bit tall. But besides that, that's mostly it. Now, what about the upsides, though? The display is amazing. Performance and everything is well done now. The speaker is finally great. The overall camera experience is absolutely top. And now I want to get into one thing. It's the value. Last year I had an issue com com recommending it at all just because it was so crazy expensive. And when I bought it, it was still 850. But I think it was two days ago it was on sale for 650 euros. And that like one or two weeks after the launch. For that price, I have to say, if you can live with the weak battery but want everything else to be... The on top because I've seen in the rating I never had a phone with so many five stars being very close to five gold stars especially on the cam in some aspects and on the display but I decided just because it's early on in the year to keep it at five stars but very very well balanced phone now it does everything great just not the battery so if you are someone who needs his phone to work for five six consistent hours of screen on time this won't be it unless you have a chance to maybe charge up a little bit in between that's the only thing i otherwise don't really have an issue yes i, I would like it to be more like 16 by 9 just being a little bit smaller but someone like me who didn't really like the S8 because the speaker wasn't all that great, battery life wasn't all that great back then either but the performance was then quite laggy still and I wasn't just used to the the bigger, taller format, which by now I just have to accept. And yeah, now, especially for a price at 650 or something like that, which will maybe even drop quite soon. But in most regions, it's available and ready for under 700. And they did a banging job. I have to, job. I have to say that. I have to admit it. I yeah, I'm impressed because I thought the experience would have been pretty much the same as last year. But I think with those smaller enhancements, like for the speaker and especially the performance now being super consistent and then a few other minor changes, it feels so much better. And talking about feel, yes, last year it felt cheap, this year it doesn't, which is something that I <laughs> complained a lot about. So, yeah, nothing else to add. If you have, you know, comments, otherwise, a like and that's it. Okay, until next time.